Hello, this is Freen Olson, Crop Economist and Marketing Specialist with NDSU Extension. This is the weekly soybean update for the week of January 28th through February 3rd. This week we're going to focus on a brief update on the status of the current trade negotiations between the United States and China. Senior level US and Chinese trade officials have just completed two days of face-to-face -face negotiations in Washington DC. They met on January 30th and 31st. Now the initial reports that are coming out of these negotiations were very positive. It sounds like there was some progress made. And as part of these trade talks, China has announced that they will purchase an additional 5 million metric tons, or approximately 184 million bushels, of US soybeans. Now, these purchases will likely take place over time and won't be a single purchase of, of 5 million metric tons. But the fact that the Chinese are continuing to buy U.S. product as agricultural products as they negotiate these terms is a very positive sign. The other thing that was kind of a major announcement coming out of this was that U.S. negotiating team was invited to visit Beijing in mid-February. Now, again, this will continue the face-to-face -face negotiations. I do want to make sure that everybody understands negotiations are going on almost continuously via conference call or web conferencing. Um, so there are talks going on on a regular basis, but the face-to-face -face negotiations are the ones that seem to make the most progress, and those are the ones where commitments are made. Now there was a rumor, and I want to emphasize a rumor, that President Trump and President Xi of China would also attend a face-to-face -face meeting later on in February to try and seal this comprehensive deal. It's always difficult to try and sift through and interpret the information that comes out after a major trade negotiations session like we just completed in Washington, D.C. What I try and do is focus in on the comments that are made by kind of the key leaders in these negotiation process. And one of those is U.S. Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer. Now, Mr. Lighthizer is really the chief negotiator, the head person for negotiating the, the terms of, the, of any kind of deal that, between the U.S. and China. His comments in the press release afterwards said that there was substantial progress made on intellectual property and forced technology transfer issues. And again, these are really the two very big picture issues that are, are central to the, the negotiations. Agriculture is important. Obviously, it's important to, to us in production agriculture, but these are the really two areas that we have the greatest disagreement and have the most challenges. Now, when asked about the, the opportunity for an actual deal to be completed by the March 1 deadline, um, Mr. Lighthizer said, that at this point, it's impossible for me to predict success, but we're in a place where if things work out, it could happen. So the, again, ending on kind of a positive tone. During the press conference, Mr. Lighthizer was asked some additional follow-up questions regarding the specific objectives for the U.S. trade negotiating team during this last round of talks. And especially as it related to this intellectual property rights as well as forced technology transfer. And his comment was really in three areas. They want to be more specific to make sure that both parties understand what is expected in the terms. Second is to be all-encompassing, that includes a broad range of products and goods and services, and that it also be enforceable. And of course, enforcement becomes a major issue. Now, what are some of the mechanisms that could be used as part of this enforcement? One of them that was discussed, and I want to emphasize may be included, would be some kind of snapback provisions where U.S. tariffs would automatically be reinitiated if the Chinese did not follow through on their commitments. Another point of discussion was, well, would the U.S. and Chinese tariffs, which are currently in place, be part of this discussion? And no, those tariffs that are currently in place will stay in place. Now let's try and transition into what are the implications for U.S. soybean prices as a result of the information we gained from these last trade uh, discussions. This slide provides a brief summary of the purchases of U.S. soybeans by the Chinese since the beginning of the marketing year on September 1. The purchases that are listed for December, those four purchases are actual numbers that have been reported uh, into the US, USDA reporting system and are, are, are actual verifiable numbers. The sale on January 7th um, was a trade rumor 
Um, we don't have the exact numbers yet because the um, export sales reports were halted due to the government shutdown. These are the trade estimates that came in on, on the amount of purchases. So if we add all those up, the total purchases of U.S. soybeans by the Chinese is somewhere between 3 and 3.7 million metric ton. Now, just as a reference point, between September 1 and January 11th of last year, the Chinese had purchased approximately 21 million metric ton. So they are behind the curve in, in their normal purchasing patterns uh, because of the tariffs. Uh, again, there was an announcement they were going to purchase an additional 5 million metric ton over the next several weeks to be able to increase that amount. But again, the total values are well below what we would see this time last year. So how have world soybean prices responded to these trade negotiations? This is a graph of uh, soybean prices received at a port. So it would be the inbound soybeans, not the price of the soybeans loaded onto a vessel, but it would be the price for soybeans delivered to a port facility. The red line is the US PNW. So that's the eight, lo eight elevator locations in the Pacific Northwest. The uh, green line is the US Gulf. So that would be in the Gulf of Mexico. The blue line is B Brazilian port, Paranagua. And the black line is the Argentina River ports. And as you can see, historically, if you're kind of under normal market conditions, looking back in January of 2018, those prices tend to be clustered very closely together. And then as we move through time, as we move into the summer months and then into the, into the harvest, you see this big discrepancy or difference between the prices in the United States and the prices in South America. And of course, that's because of, of the tariffs and shifting uh, trade patterns. But you see also see now recently as the negotiations have become more, more fluid between the United States and China, that the world prices for soybeans have started to narrow up and being, being again very clustered together. So based on today's prices, the US soybean prices as well as those prices for South American soybeans at the export terminals are very, very similar. We've also seen some adjustments in the basis levels for soybeans at different points within the United States. This figure shows the basis levels at specific elevators in, that I use to kind of represent a region or a state. The red line is North Dakota, the brown line is South Dakota, the black line is Minnesota, the blue line is Iowa, the purple line is Nebraska, the green line is Illinois, and that um, dark blue line on the very top is Lu the Louisiana Gulf. So again, you can see that, we, that these basis patterns tend to go up and down together. In the North Dakota region, we had this very deep drop in basis or very negative basis as we moved into the harvest months. We've seen some recovery now as the, the trade flows have begun to open up in the Pacific Northwest and as the local elevators are able to work through this backlog of soybeans that were delivered at harvest. So the, the elevators that I have talked to are starting now to get cleaned out of the soybeans. They have some additional room and some additional capacity to handle more soybeans when necessary. So you start to see that basis level start to improve. So one of the common questions that I get from farmers is what will happen if China does come in and start buying large quantities of U.S. soybeans? Do we have the capacity to be able to handle that? And what's going to happen to local basis levels? Well, there's obviously a lot of pieces to that. One is how quickly and of what quantities do the Chinese come in and purchase? If they do, is it going to be in large chunks or is it going to be smaller amounts over time? The second is what's the capacity at the local elevator level to be able to handle more soybeans? What's the capacity of the rail system to be able to handle that? And then finally, what's the capacity constraints out in the Pacific Northwest on the export terminals? Well, to answer that last question, the USDA uh, Grain Transportation Report provides a weekly updates on the movement of grain in the United States, not only by rail, but also by barge. And they track the volumes of grain shipped to different port locations. This is one of the figures that's reported every week I want you to focus in on that dotted green line on the very top. That represents the rail deliveries of grain to the Pacific Northwest elevators. And again, it's, it's weekly information, so we go back into 2016. As you can see, there's quite a bit of variability, and there are some seasonal patterns that we start to pick up. I want you to really focus in on the information on the far right-hand side. If you notice the grain shipments, again, this is by rail to the PNW ports, 
we have been relatively high, not only through last winter, but then also through the summer months. But now as we get into the, the winter months, it started to, to drop off. Two-fold reason for that, obviously we don't have the soybean shipments out to the PNW that we normally see at this time of year, but also the, the corn shipments from the Northern Plains into the PNW ports have also been slowing. Now, as I talk to local elevators, what they're saying is that the rail transportation system has been very fluid. Um, the, the turnaround times have been very, very um, high levels, so we, we do not have any major constraints. Now, the cold weather we've had the last few days may have slowed that up a little bit, but the, the grain movement right now and the, and the logistics system that we have has some additional capacity to be able to handle larger volumes of grain as we move forward in time. So my suspicion is, my expectation is that as we move forward, if there are additional purchases of so U.S. soybeans by China, that the basis levels will start to respond, that we've now worked our way through this this backlog of grain and that we're becoming much more fluid. And so local basis levels should be more responsive to the needs of the marketplace, which again should be positive for U.S. farmers and in particular farmers in this area. So this completes this week's update. Uh, please feel free to contact me if you have any questions or need some additional information. Thank you for listening.